another day to live another fairy tale it's another night to drink and then forget The year was 2009, the Oscars. The Dark Knight receives eight nominations, but no mention of the director's name. The Academy once again passed over Christopher's candidacy. How can a billion dollars be unsophisticated? Everyone went to see the Dark Knight. Despite the success of his films, his only nominations remained the one for best screenplay for Memento. By the way, not long before the Batman sequel came out, a remake of Memento appeared in Bollywood. However, the Nolans were neither warned, nor mentioned in the credits, nor paid a cent. Thankfully, the conflict never made it to the courts, because when the producers found out that the director was not pleased, they contacted him and smoothed things over. At least you're being honest about ripping me off. Well, you're not going to remember anyway. In the summer of 2009, Christopher lost his place as star of the family. His older brother ended up in the epicenter of a plot worthy of any crime thriller, threats, abduction, murder, and an attempted escape from prison. It all began four years older when Matthew, under a false name, met Robert Cohen, an accountant from Costa Rica who was connected to a drug cartel. According to the authorities, Cohen owed a huge amount of money and Nolan was hired to return it. Matthew arrived in Costa Rica. Within a day, the accountant vanished and a week later was found dead. By that time, Matthew had left the country and the police weren't able to catch his trail. In 2009, Nolan appeared at a hearing regarding his bankruptcy and was detained and supposed to be extradited to Costa Rica, but the Chicago courts didn't confirm the accusations presented by their South American colleagues and rejected the appeal. Nonetheless, he was in danger of serving time in his homeland since they found a rope of sheets tied together in his cell, as well as some lockpicks. Lucky for Nolan, his lawyers were able to get the charges lifted, and a few years later, Matthew even tried to sue for financial compensation for the time he was unlawfully held in custody. Christopher didn't comment on the situation, and the press soon refocused on a story that would have been the envy of any thriller's plot. To tell the story of Inception, we have to go back in time. Like that. After the release of Insomnia, Christopher was taken with the idea of conscious dreams. Every movie theater was showing movies about illusionary worlds, and still under the effect of The Matrix, The 13th Floor, and Dark City, he decided to write a story that took place in the kingdom of Morpheus. At first, he planned to shoot a horror film and even pitched the concept to Warner Brothers. The studio thought it was complex, but liked the idea. Nolan began to write the script, but the process dragged on for seven years. He would return to the text between shooting and waited for the opportune time. The main reason for the delay was not having enough experience with films of epic proportions. 
However, after the release of The Dark Knight, Chris became more confident and finally landed on an appropriate genre. Horror was replaced with adventure thriller, where multi-layered dreams were likened to the stages of robbing a bank. One would think that after the smashing success of the previous movie, Warner would agree to any project of Nolan's, but the executives were deterred by the complexity of the narrative and lack of literary base. The director had only written his debut film by himself. The rest, he had based on comics, stories, and novels. Also, when writing the script for Inception, he didn't utilize any scientific research about dreams, just his personal experience. A lot of what I find you want to do with research is just confirming things things you want to do. If the research contradicts what you want to do, you tend to go ahead and do it anyway. So at a certain point, I realized that if you're trying to reach an audience, being as subjective as possible and really trying to write from something genuine is the way to go. In order to convince the studio to back the project, Nolan demonstrated how one could easily understand the layers. The first was rain, the second, night at the hotel, and the third, the snowy mountain range. But Warner gave Inception the green light only after Christopher promised to make a third installment of Batman. Also, Nolan convinced Leonardo DiCaprio to join the project, whose name guaranteed commercial success. It is possible. Leo was Christopher's only candidate for the lead role. He never imagined anyone else as playing Dom Cobb. The director had already communicated with DiCaprio about participating in his other projects, but just couldn't seem to find the right fit. This time, DiCaprio was inspired by the premise, which reminded him of Memento and Insomnia, but on steroids. Hey guys, hey. How are you, how you doing, huh? The actor plunged into the preparation, and even convinced Nolan to change the structure of the narrative. You, you asked me for Inception. I do hope you understand the, the gravity of that request. Leonardo and Christopher spent two months rewriting and enhancing the screenplay. The work DiCaprio did on his character with Chris made the movie less of a puzzle and more the story of a character audiences could relate to. If you jump, you're not gonna wake up, remember? You're gonna die, now just... Just step back inside, come on. But DiCaprio wasn't the only one Nolan had envisioned in a role. The director had dreamed of working with Ken Watanabe, again after his cameo in Batman Begins. Impressive. The actor's charisma amazed him, so Chris wrote a role specifically for him. Do you want to take a leap of faith? Or become an old man filled with regret? As for Michael Caine, he took part in the fourth of Christopher's films in a row. So you, you want me to let someone else follow you into your fantasy? It so happens that Kane accidentally gave away the main spoiler of the movie. During an interview with BBC Radio 1, Michael was saying how he couldn't tell the difference himself between the dream and reality sequences and asked the director to help him. Chris answered him in one sentence. Well, when you're in the scene, it's reality. Another longtime friend for whom Christopher reserved a role was Killian Murphy. This is a dream. I should just kill myself to wake up. Right. Later, luck favored Nolan in his search for fresh faces. Pleased to meet you. Ellen Page was admitted to the project without an audition. The director explained the premise to the actress, and when he saw her keen interest, realized that he had found what he was looking for. Mind telling your subconscious to take it easy? It's my subconscious. Remember, I can't control it. Dilip Rao and Tom Berenger also happily joined the project. Uh, those bastards have had at me for two days. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, on the other hand, was a second choice. Chris chose him after James Franco turned down his offer and decided to do Danny Boyle's 127 Hours. That's for sure! Nolan chose Tom Hardy because of his part in Rock and Rolla, though the actor thought that it was because of his part in the drama, Bronson. My name's Charles Bronson. And all my life I've wanted to be famous. It was only during shooting that he realized that Chris had never even seen Winding Refn's film. Oh, great. Thank you. Nolan also convinced Marion Cotillard to join the cast and her role eventually made it into the cinematographer's list of the top femme fatale. I don't believe in one reality anymore. So choose. Choose to be here. Choose me. There was, of course, 
one more new face. Christopher's son, Magnus, made his debut in this film. Nolan got the cast together and while the decorations were being prepared, explained to the actors the thousands of symbolic references in the screenplay, present even in the names of the characters. The hero is Dom Cobb. The name Dom was borrowed from the Russian word for home and reveals the protagonist's desire to return there. When are you coming home, Dad? How would you like to go home? I don't know how much you want to go home. I think I found a way home. I need to get home. That's all I care about right now. Then I've got to get back home. You need the simplest version of the idea in order for it to grow naturally in your subject's mind. That's a very subtle art. Are you all right, Mr. Cobb? Cobb is the last name of a famous American architect who designed skyscrapers. That is why Dom's limbo is filled with them. You built all this? This is incredible. We built for years. Cobb was also the main character in Christopher's first full-length film. My name's Cobb. Mal means bad, or unlucky in both Spanish and French, and clearly identifies her role in the story. The death was the only escape. Robert Fisher is a nod to world chess champion Bobby Fisher, and Maurice Fisher is an allusion to the artist Moritz Escher, whose drawings inspired the visual effects of the film. See? Paradox. Ellen Page's character is named Ariadne. According to Greek mythology, she was the daughter of Minas, who helped Theseus escape the labyrinth of the Minotaur. The film character does the exact same thing. As soon as the music ends, you blow up the hospital, and we all ride the kick back up the layers. But Nolan didn't stop there. The first letters of the characters' names spell out the message of the story. Dreams pay. Additionally, each member of the Inception team is a metaphor for roles in the movie industry. Cobb is the director, Arthur, the producer, Ariadne, the production designer, Eames, the actor, Sato, the studio, Yusuf, the technician, and Robert Fisher, the audience. Pay attention to the strangeness of the weather, the shift in gravity. None of this is real. In trying to write a team-based creative process, I wrote the one I know, Cobb. It's rare that you can identify yourself so clearly in a film. This film is very clear for me. It's the chance to build cathedrals, entire cities, things that never existed, things that couldn't exist in the real world. Another sly detail in the story is Edith Piaf's song. It doesn't only play upon waking up. Hans Zimmer explains that the whole soundtrack is based on pieces from the composition which have been slowed down or sped up. Basically, the audience is listening to the same music the whole movie, which naturally weaves in with the dreams. All the music in the score is subdivisions and multiplications of the tempo of Edith Piaf's track. I was surprised how long it took them to figure it out. It wasn't supposed to be a secret. Even the timing of the whole film is an homage of sorts to Non, je ne regrette rien. The original track which Hans Zimmer found in the governmental archives of France is 2 minutes and 28 seconds long. The cinema version of Inception is 2 hours and 28 minutes long. And after the credits finish rolling, the song starts again. In doing this, the director added another level of film industry metaphors and compared the end of the movie with a dream from which the viewer eventually has to wake up. I am impressed. Your condescension, as always, is much appreciated, Arthur. Thank you. Nolan not only found his inspiration in music, but in film also. He repeatedly called the movie On Your Majesty's Secret Service, the best of the James Bond franchise. This movie about Agent 007 inspired him to add in a winter scene. Christopher was also enchanted by the perfect balance of action, romance, and drama in that Bond installment, and he tried to replicate it in his own movie. Now, before you bother telling me it's impossible. It's no, it's perfectly possible. It's just bloody difficult. Another source of innovation were the Japanese anime Akira and Paprika, from which Nolan extensively borrowed imagery. Feel that?
the middle of July 2009, Chris traveled to Tokyo, where he began shooting. After a few scenes in Japan, the team relocated to Great Britain, where they built sets which baffled the imagination. Listen, if you're going to perform Inception, you need imagination. Again, Christopher chose to bring his fantasy to life without graphics. Now, let's just do this in post, and we all knew that we couldn't. It just had to be done properly in order for it to be a believable thing. Though in a film where reality itself is in question, graphics couldn't be avoided. In most cases, the CGI only enhanced the special effects, but did not replace them. He favored creativity over green screens, and one of the most impressive feats was the rotating corridor. The technology was inherited directly from Space Odyssey. And I like the idea of repurposing that technology and really trying to, to choreograph an entire fight sequence. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, along with a team of stuntmen, spent two weeks in it. It was like some incredible torture device. We thrashed Joseph for weeks, but in the end, we looked at the footage and it looks unlike anything any of us had seen before. The rhythm of it is unique. And when you watch it, even if you know how it is done, it confuses your perception. However, it was the combination with CGI which made this scene so spectacular. There were hundreds of cables and suspended objects which were imitating zero gravity. This was the result of Nolan's vision regarding the marriage of special effects and computer graphics. Trains on the road, waves on the streets, Escher's actual staircase, and the explosion in the square. The only scenes which were completely computer generated were the ones in Limbo and the scene by the bridge. The Infinity Mirror refers to Nolan's earlier works, Doodlebug, and the Memento poster. The chase and fall from the bridge were filmed over four months in Los Angeles, and actors falling in slow-mo spent a whole day in the minivan. The film crew faced its final hurdle in Canada, where they built the set of the fortress. But November of 2009 turned out to be abnormally warm, and two days before the arrival of the actors, Christopher's location manager sent him photos of a set covered in dirt instead of snow. About a week before we went to Canada, there was no snow. The whole thing was built around snow, and so we were very, very tense. Luckily, a day later, Alberta got the worst snowstorm it had seen in decades. Thanks to several similar strokes of luck, Nolan was able to finish filming early and save 10% of the budget. Is it possible? Of course not. In the editing stage, representatives of Warner Brothers tried to talk Nolan into making the movie in 3D. However, the director feared that the effect would distract from the story itself, and instead of seeing the illusions on the screen, the audience would see only the illusions of depth. So he convinced the studio to scrap the idea. Don't do that! Don't do that! Chris and Lee Smith edited the film over the next seven months. The duo was able to combine multi-layered dreams, action, and drama into one uninterrupted sequence, which pulls the viewer in and keeps him there from the first seconds. This was when a broad promotion campaign was launched. The studio invested $100 million in advertising the film, and it paid off when Inception's profits exceeded $800 million. The stronger the issues, the more powerful the catharsis. This result not only flattered Christopher and Leonardo's egos, but it also lined their wallets. Before shooting, they stipulated in their contract that they wanted a percentage of the profit, rather than a fixed sum. Money, not just money. Despite the financial success, once again, Christopher was not able to win Hollywood's most important prize. Inception was nominated for eight statuettes and won half of them. Oscar goes to Wally Pfister for Inception. It was the fifth film together with Wally Pfister and this fourth nomination which finally won him an Oscar for Best Cinematography. Ah, uh, I'll take a breath here for a minute. Breathe it in for a second. 
This is, hey, you. <laughs> Since Chris once again refused to switch filming crews, each scene in the movie was a direct result of Pfister's work. None of what I w did was, would have been possible without the incredible vision of my master, Christopher Nolan. His work... Not only was Wally victorious, but so was the sound editing, sound mixing, and the visual effects team. Um, uh, it feels like that top is still spinning, but I don't really care anymore. Unfortunately, the finale of the evening didn't meet expectations. The Social Network won Best Soundtrack, Alice in Wonderland won Best Production Design, and Nolan didn't win the Best Original Screenplay category for the second time in his career. King's Speech, David Sodden. The victor of that evening was The King's Speech, which even beat Inception in the Best Picture nomination. The King's Speech! Yeah. Not to mention, Nolan was not even nominated for Best Director, and not a single actor from the ensemble was nominated either. <laughs> The public felt differently, however. The movie is being talked about to this day, and it appears in many of the top 10 greatest movies of all time lists. Christopher wasn't too bothered by the loss, since he was used to being underestimated by the Academy. Instead of feeling sorry for himself, he got to work on a new project. I'm done. I'm sorry. When the director took on Batman Begins, he had only planned on making the one film. Yet here he was eight years later, finishing up a trilogy. Still, he was hesitant about making the finale. I have to ask the question, how many good third movies in a franchise can people name? Plus, if the director had been planning on shooting a third movie, he would have changed the plot of the previous installments. For example, Aaron Eckert wanted to return to the role of Harvey Dent, but the plot of The Dark Knight didn't presume to have a sequel, and Christopher told the actor, no. You can look me in the eye and tell me you're sorry. The studio wanted to return the Joker, especially since there was some unused footage left over and they had the option of using CGI. But Chris thought that bringing back the character would be a disrespect to the memory of Heath Ledger and turn the idea down. I wanted to see what you'd do. And you didn't disappoint. Then the executives suggested that they bring the Riddler to the big screen and invite Leonardo DiCaprio to play him. However, Chris thought that the Riddler was an obvious copy of the Joker and decided to use the character Bane for The Dark Knight Rises. Bane. Let's not stand on ceremony here. The antagonist was played by Tom Hardy, who had impressed Christopher in Inception, and who finally convinced him to watch Bronson. <laughs> Tom entrusted himself to the director and agreed without even reading the script. Hardy put on over 20 pounds of muscle mass and spent a year learning martial arts. His inspiration for the role was Bartley Gorman, the king of gypsy boxing and he borrowed his moves and dialect for the character. See, you can't be a fighter if you're afraid of anyone. Now's not the time for fear. That comes later. Christopher also brought with him Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Marion Cotillard from his previous Bruce, picture. if you want to save the world, you have to stop trusting it. I'm trusting you. Doesn't count, you have no choice. Yes. The director wanted the actress to play Miranda Tate on the screen so badly that her pregnancy was of no consequence. He simply moved the shooting dates so that she could participate. Yes, the shooting of a $250 million project was delayed for six months, and Marion started working four weeks after giving birth. So why waste my time, indeed? Finding someone to play Catwoman was much harder. Many actresses hoped to get the role, but only Anne Hathaway. Jessica Biel, and Rooney Mara made it to the screen tests. Funnily enough, Hathaway had no idea who she was supposed to play. Before meeting Christopher, she thought that she was going to play Harley Quinn. It's me. Oops. At the beginning of May 2011, the director went to India. They were working on the underground prison escape scene in Jodhpur. And as for filming the interior, they built a set almost 100 feet high. So we certainly built a very, very large set, but it plays as even larger with the way we shot it with wide angle. Then the team went to Pittsburgh, which replaced Chicago in playing the city of Gotham in the previous pictures. We had a fantastic time there, and we loved it, while we literally have shot every inch of that city.
but they actually switched location for another reason. The Civic Arena was supposed to be demolished. Nolan hoped to turn it into Gotham Stadium and blow it up on camera like the hospital in the previous movie. Unfortunately, the arena found itself in the middle of a lawsuit, and the demolition was approved only after the shooting was over. Maybe the time isn't right. The executive producer, Thomas Tull, who also partially owns the Pittsburgh Steelers, saved the day. Thomas gave the crew permission to shoot on the Steelers' home field and even blow it up. The Gotham Rogues were played by professional athletes, and the Steelers' coach almost got blown up in front of thousands of extras on set. Bill Cower gave a speech to the crowd and then ran to a room under the bleachers across a field loaded with mines. The coach got lucky, and Nolan's love for visual effects gave the film an unforgettable scene. By the way, the extras were all wearing winter coats, even though they were shooting in the heat of summer, which means that anyone who wanted to participate in the new Batman movie had to be ready to sweat. The most difficult scene to coordinate was the one on Wall Street. The finale of the trilogy required more than a thousand people to gather on one street. And I looked at them lined up, and I said to Brandon, the second AD, and gosh, it's not really enough. And then somebody said, oh, actually, that's just half of them. These weren't just extras. These actors rehearsed for two days, and every person's actions were carefully choreographed. <laughs> On set, there were also scores of makeup artists, stylists, and administrators who thought through every minute of that day. And that whole operation, makeup, hair, wardrobe, props and breakfast was done so that at seven o'clock when the director walked on the set, he had 1,100 people in position. There was an incredible spirit in what they did, an incredible spirit to those extras. I really felt like a great sense of fun, a great sense of energy. After Nolan blew up a football field and held an epic battle on the city streets, car explosions and road demolition don't seem so impressive. The director once again stuck to his guns and avoided computer graphics. They even filmed the chase on the bat pods and the flight of the bat wing. The longest one we did was 600 feet of travel, the emergence of the bat. Another warned me about getting into cars with strange men. This isn't a car. Leaving out CGI was more expensive, not just because of more shooting time. For example, Anne Hathaway's extra crashed into a $500,000 IMAX camera. And the Batwing lost a wing when it collided with a road sign. Whoa! At least the CIA plane used in the intro scenes made it out in one piece. A very large scale action scene. which at first blush I think people would assume was done with some degree of visual effects. But much more than anyone would ever realize was done for real. This was harder than it seemed because the stunts were all performed in real life. The only exception was the barrel roll and explosion which were filmed separately and then combined in post-production. That scene introduced Bane and also created controversy around a certain cameo. Fans believe that Nolan, knowing that Matthew McConaughey would star in the next film, had him play the pilot. This theory is supported by the lack of the pilot's names in the credits. That I say, all right, all right, all right. Christopher shot almost an hour and a half on film using the IMAX cameras and forbade the studio to convert the footage into 3D. Paid you a small fortune. And this gives you power over me? Spreading the love of film became Christopher's mission. Nolan held a private showing of the first six minutes of The Dark Knight Rises for a few extraordinary directors, including Edgar Wright, Michael Bay, John Favreau, Brian Singer, and Eli Roth. I wanted to give them a chance to see the potential, because I think IMAX is the best film format that was ever invented. The message I wanted to put out there was that no one is taking anyone's digital cameras away. But if we want film to continue as an option, and someone is working on a big studio movie with the resources and the power to insist on film, they should say so. I felt as if I didn't say anything, and that we started to lose that option. It would be a shame.
The director's words display an exquisite understanding of the relationship between technology and the viewer's desires. Tickets to the IMAX version in New York were sold out six months before the premiere. This is a stock exchange. There's no money you can steal. Really? And why are you people here? As always, Nolan filled the picture with many illusions. The plot of the film was based on Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, the fight on Wall Street by Inspired by Gangs of New York. Bruce Wayne's doctor treated Sammy Jenkins 12 years prior. It's a test, Sammy. We'll test this, you fucking quack. The residual concussive damage to your brain tissue and the general scarred over quality of your body, I cannot recommend that you go hella skiing, Mr. Wayne. Right. And the introduction of The Dark Knight Rises mimics the beginning of License to Kill. Take the load! <laughs> the creators of the new James Bond film returned the favor when they based Raul Silva on Bane. This has cost you your strength. Victory has defeated you. You see what comes of all this running around, Mr. Bond? All this jumping and fighting. It's exhausting. Once again, Chris and Wally Pfister created a visual masterpiece, but it was time to say farewell. After 12 years of collaboration, the cinematographer embarked on his own directing journey. Is there a soul? And if so, where does it reside? Christopher supported his friend in his new beginning and even produced his debut film, Transcendence. While it was a large project for a first time director, it was too intriguing for me to pass up. Well, you're good. I'm fine, Evelyn. I'm online. John Newton Howard also left Nolan's team. After Hans Zimmer and Chris worked on the soundtrack for Inception without him, he felt like a third wheel and left the team. The last installment of the Batman trilogy premiered on the 20th of July, 2012. It was greeted with commercial success. The film made more than a billion dollars at the box office, in third place after The Avengers and the aforementioned Skyfall. Critics and audience loved the movie, but the Academy did not. For the first time since 2002, Nolan's film did not receive a single Oscar nomination. So Chris's prediction about trilogies came true after all. So that's what that feels like. Despite this, Chris did not rush to leave the DC universe. In fact, that very year he had been working on the screenplay for a new adaptation of the Superman comics. Warner Brothers had struck gold and were not about to squander Batman's success. David Goyer and Christopher wrote the text and gave it to Zack Snyder. The director received complete creative control over the project, and Chris and David stayed on as artistic consultants and were able to insert aspects of Batman into the movie. People are afraid of what they don't understand. This is a world you never understand, and you always fear what you don't understand. The story of Christopher's next project actually begins before the release of his first film. Okay. In 1997, astrophysicist Kip Thorne and producer Linda Obst were working on the sci-fi drama Contact, directed by Robert Zemeckis. Your proposal seems less like science and more like science fiction. Science fiction. The picture was based on the novel by Carl Sagan, who used Thorne's theory to explain space travel in his book. Why don't they just speak English? Yeah, well, maybe because 70% of the planet speaks other languages. Mathematics is the only truly universal language center. The scientist-producer collaboration grew into a friendship, and their paths began to cross often. In the mid-2000s, Thorne asked Opes to help him visualize his mathematical calculations, describing the image of a black hole. Linda introduced Kip to the company Double Negative, and the CGI artists created a computer model of the calculations. Later, Linda and Thorne invented a story based on this cosmic phenomenon. Steven Spielberg immediately showed interest in the story and pitched it to Paramount. They liked the idea, and the studio hired Jonathan Nolan to write the script. It took him two years to write the text because he approached the matter very seriously. He attended a workshop on relativity theory at Caltech and had hundreds of discussions with Kip Thorne. When I was brought onto the project was to try to get the science right, to try to take a big idea and ground it as much as possible so you could feel it, feel the, the reality of it. In 2009, Steven broke his contract with Paramount and took his studio DreamWorks to Disney, 
The younger Nolan saw the opportunity and suggested his older brother fill the vacancy. And when the project became open, you know, immediately called up the guys at Paramount and asked if I could get involved. The studio liked this option, but before taking the director's chair, Christopher had to agree to Thorne's demands. The scientist only insisted on one thing, that the film would not break the laws of physics. Though Chris wasn't against that, later on, it took three weeks of convincing to get the director to scrap his idea of traveling faster than the speed of light. The discussion emerged when Christopher rewrote parts of the script. He left the dystopian fate of the Earth and scientific content from Jonathan's version, but changed the plot. For the first time in his career, Nolan created a conflict that was with external threat, rather than between characters. While Chris was working on the details of the narrative, the fact that he agreed to work for Paramount Pictures led to a series of talks between the biggest players in Hollywood. In order not to lose their MVP, Warner Brothers offered to invest in the film jointly in exchange for a share in the Superman sequel. Now it was 2012. The brothers were putting finishing touches on the text, and Christopher began casting. First, he invited Michael Caine, who was going to be working with the director for the sixth time in a row. I'm not afraid of death. I'm an old physicist. I'm afraid of time. Then he invited Anne Hathaway, who had so impressed him while shooting The Dark Knight. It has to mean something. The irreplaceable film editor, Lee Smith, also made it into the team, as well as production designer, Nathan Crowley. I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> this is really difficult. After watching the drama Mud, Chris was enchanted by Matthew McConaughey and offered him the lead. Okay. Now you need to tell me what your plan is to save the world. 15 years prior, Matthew had starred in Contact. If you come back, You'll only be four years older, but over 50 years would have passed here on Earth. Is there any possibility? I don't know, some, some clever way we could maybe, I don't want to jump in a, in a black hole. Came back to years. <laughs> Before shooting, the actor and the director were apprehensive about working together. Matthew thought that Christopher was a perfectionist and a dictator on set, while Chris imagined McConaughey to be a wild and undisciplined playboy. As it turned out, Nolan loved a good joke, was always open to advice, and valued small imperfections, while McConaughey demonstrated complete self-denial and a serious work ethic. Mankind was born on Earth was never meant to die here. Because of the unusual structure of the film, Christopher invited five different actors to play two people. Murph was played by Mackenzie Foy, Jessica Chastain, and Ellen Burstein, while Tom was played by Casey Affleck and Timothy Chalamet. School says you're gonna follow my footsteps. I think that's great. <laughs> you think that's great? Timothy, by the way, often said that he had gotten into acting when he saw The Dark Knight and was inspired by Heath Ledger's performance. Me? Unfortunately, working with Nolan wasn't what Timothy had expected. After the premiere of Interstellar, he broke down in tears. And I saw it and I loved it, but then I went home to my dad and I like wept for an hour. Why? Because I just figured my part was like bigger or something. <laughs> oh. uh -huh. The cast was also joined by John Lithgow and Matt Damon. Our survival instinct is our single greatest source of inspiration. Damon's name wasn't on a single poster or in any trailers. The actor didn't attend the premiere, and his participation was kept a secret till the last possible moment. This was done to confuse the audience and keep the impact of the character's presence on the plot to a minimum. Dr. Mann, tell us about your world. Our world. We hope. However, the most important part of the casting had nothing to do with the actors. Nolan had only trusted Wally Pfister with a camera, and after he left, Nolan was not just looking for a cameraman, but for a partner. Chris got lucky once again. One talk with Hoyt Van Hoytema, and a new duet was born. The cinematographer had already proven himself in Hollywood while working with David O. Russell and Spike Jonze. Hoyt fulfilled a long-time dream of Nolan's when he and a few engineers modified the IMAX camera so that it could be carried by hand. No one had ever done that before. I guess what we'd never tried is what he did, which is just pick the thing up and not worry about how heavy it was. Um, how he did it, I have no idea. It's just, he's a very strong guy, clearly. Thanks to Van Hoytema's strength, Chris was able to include over an hour of footage in his favorite format. In August of 2013, Nolan went to Canada 
and began shooting the first stage of Interstellar. In Alberta, the same place four years ago where they had filmed Inception, they built the set of Cooper's village and farm. In order to film the drone chase, Nathan Crowley planted 500 acres of corn. And at this altitude, it's 4,100 feet right where we're standing. That's pretty high and pretty far north to grow corn. We've never grown corn here. Nobody has, I don't think, anywhere out here. They even made a profit from the harvest after the film was over. One of the most difficult aspects of shooting was the dust. Let's get out here. In order to portray the dust storm, they used huge fans which blew hundreds of pounds of synthetic dust. Chris gives us a lot of leeway to try and get more machines and more material and guys and whatever to cover as big an area as we can. This I mean, was inspired by the real events which occurred in 1930s America and were depicted in the 2012 documentary series called the Dust Bowl. You never really escaped the dust. It always found its way in. And that's, I think, what drove people crazy. Chris was so impressed by the documentary that he got in touch with the creators and got permission to use excerpts of the interviews with eyewitnesses of the catastrophe. Well, when we set the table, we always set the plate upside down, glasses or cups, whatever it was, upside down. Next, the film crew went to Iceland, where they shot the surfaces of the two exoplanets. While filming, the crew faced terrible weather with winds of over 100 miles per hour. The cast and crew hid in a nearby hotel, but usually when a few hours had passed, Nolan would gather them in the parking lot and shoot the wide-angle shots or rehearse scenes. And, you know, we just wanted to get on with shooting, so he whisked us all out into the parking lot where we shot some inserts as long as we could. Now you better slow down, Turbo. Safety first case, remember. First, Cooper. Those scenes contain almost no graphics, and even the shuttles, which weighed over five tons, were delivered to the farthest corners of the country. It was a pretty big undertaking to even get the crew and equipment and everything out there. We actually had to pave a road for 15 kilometers. When they finished shooting in Iceland, Nolan and his team returned to Los Angeles and filmed in sound stages for two more months. Somewhere in their fifth dimension. Nathan Crowley built the inside of the spaceship based on the interior of the International Space Station, while Christopher made sure there were no green screens involved. Double negative created most of the backdrops ahead of time, so instead of a chroma key, they installed screens that played the illustrations and effects. This helped the actors and added a sense of realism to the lighting. Nolan also refused to use computer-generated spaceships, preferring mini and to scale models, some of which were 50 feet long. It's good to have as much scale as you can possibly get because you need the model to break up into convincing chunks and get all the physics right. And the smaller the models get, the harder that becomes. Thanks to their size, Hoyt van Hoytema was even able to fasten cameras to the ships to imitate the IMAX shots taken from the NASA missions in open space. Zero gravity was achieved thanks to methods used in Inception. Though the actors had it much tougher, and many of the scenes proved the wonders that physical training can achieve. We take a camera crane, and instead of putting a camera on it, we put an actor in, and wheel them around, and they had to be uh, harnessed that way for hours sometimes. That was probably not that easy for the actors. Despite the fact that the events occur in the future, Nolan didn't want to imagine new elements of design for the new world. No matter how hard costume and set designers try, it's impossible to guess what the future will look like. I wanted to eliminate that thinking entirely from the design process so that we could put our efforts elsewhere. Their artistic energy was redirected to create original robots. Hello, Case. Hello, Tars. In the first version of the script, they were anthropomorphic AIs, but then Nolan decided he wanted to bring something new to the screen. He and Jonathan invented an AI named Tars, whom they defined not as a robot, but as a machine. Before you get all teary, try to remember that as a robot, I have to do anything you say. During the preparation stage, Chris hadn't imagined that it could be anything but CGI, 
but the special effects technicians created five-foot-tall marionettes weighing 200 pounds. The machine was operated by an actor who was then edited out of the scenes in post-production. The artist who played this role would have to be able to operate the machine as well as play the part. What I was looking for was somebody to take on the job of giving life and personality to what is essentially, you know, an inanimate object. That was how Bill Irving, an experienced circus performer and a voice actor known to every American child as Mr. Noodle from Sesame Street, came to be part of the ensemble. Mr. Noodle! Mr. Noodle! There you are! <laughs> Bill spent two months with a team of engineers and helped perfect the robots. Specialists created many variations that were adapted to specific circumstances and sets. For example, in order for Case to be able to move on the water planet, two versions of the machine were attached to quad bikes. Come on! Unfortunately, they couldn't avoid CGI completely. The structure and technical abilities of the robots couldn't be communicated without computer graphics. Five, the CGI specialists were not only creating works of art, each image of cosmic phenomena was in line with the latest research in astrophysics, and sometimes even ahead of it. And I saw this disk wrap up over the black hole and under the black hole. I'd known it intellectually, but knowing it intellectually is completely different than seeing it, than feeling it. Interstellar sparked many discussions in the science world. The last people to starve will be the first to suffocate. And your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. Two aspects that bothered everyone were the dust storms, which would have required over a million years to destroy the Earth's atmosphere, and the ice clouds, which are impossible due to the laws of gravity. And let's not forget the burning corn. I brought up to uh, Christopher, and you know, Christopher, uh, green corn doesn't burn. And um, he was like, uh, um, um, well, in our movie it does. Apart from that the film is considered science fiction of the highest quality, the movie impeccably describes wormholes, black holes, gravity, and the passage of time on the first planet. What's this gonna cost us, Brian? A lot. Decades. Well, that's relativity, folks. Even the popular astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, while acknowledging the aforementioned inconsistencies, was very complimentary and became a faithful fan of the film. We need more movies by marquee directors with marquee actors that treat science that seriously. He even defended the events of the finale in the black hole. And we don't know what's in a black hole, so take it and run with it. And of course, a movie as complex as this couldn't lack for illusions. The bookshelves were filled with the scientific literature that Chris had studied before shooting. There were also a few allusions to the plot. The Stand by Stephen King pays homage to the post-apocalyptic fate of the Earth. Jane Austen's Emma is a nod to Christopher's wife, and the timely appearance of James Elroy's crime novel, The Big Nowhere, is simply a joke. That's it. Besides the books, the location of the wormhole is also of interest. Stanley Kubrick had originally wanted to film part of Space Odyssey near Saturn, but couldn't replicate the rings. I'm afraid I can't do that. So Christopher decided to honor the iconic director's memory and complete his vision. The fact that hope of salvation from starvation appeared near this planet is also symbolic because in ancient Rome, Saturn was the god of fertility and sowing seed. But that's not all. In ancient Greece, Saturn was called Kronos, the god of time. And time happens to be the main theme of the film. Time is relative, okay. Other visual elements support this claim. The 12 sections of the endurance are built to represent the hours on a clock's face. While its name refers to the British vessel to make a successful transatlantic journey, though it was shipwrecked, every member of the crew was saved. This makes it seem as though the characters in the movie chose the name, in hopes that all the astronauts would be saved. What's your humor setting, Dodge? That is 100 percent. Let's bring it on down to 75, please. And last but not least, in the finale, when Cooper touches Amelia, they reproduce Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Christopher drew inspiration from Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris and Mirror, Event Horizon, 
and the aforementioned contact. The design for TARS and CASE was inspired by the monolith from Space Odyssey. Hans Zimmer also borrowed the music from it for the moment when Cooper falls into the Tesseract. I know you doubt. Approaching the event horizon. Nolan believes that the Interstellar soundtrack is the composer's best work of his career. Their fifth collaborative project gave the world a soundtrack that almost eclipses the movie itself. The director didn't even give Hans a script, just one page of instructions, and yet, the music fits the story perfectly. For example, during the scene on the water planet, each click represents the passage of one day on Earth. The movie premiered on the 26th of October, 2014. What is the hardest part of filmmaking for you? This. Yeah. <laughs> filmmaking. Unquestionably. Not, not <laughs> Box office profits of almost 700 million were a more than respectable haul for such a complex sci-fi movie. Also, Nolan's contract added a tidy sum to his bank account. Besides his $20 million salary, he received 20% of the profit. Just try to imagine that. Despite the film's success, it divided viewers into two completely opposite camps. Luckily, no one debated the fact that the visual aspect of the movie astounded the imagination. At the beginning of the next year, Chris, along with popular comics author Sean Gordon Murphy, published a graphic novel entitled Absolute Zero, a prequel to Interstellar starring Dr. Mann. At the Oscars in February, Interstellar was nominated in five different categories. Once again, Chris was nominated neither for Best Screenplay nor Best Director. Murphy's Law. None of the actors were nominated either. At least the movie won Best Visual Effects and was nominated for Best Soundtrack, Sound Editing, and Production Design. We lost it. No, we didn't. As usual, lack of success at the Oscars didn't seem to phase Christopher, since he was already cooking up his next idea. I think this is the end of the road. He did take a break to spend some time with his family, but in a few months, resumed work. His new challenge was a documentary debut. The short, Quay, is a story about twin brothers Stephen and Timothy Quay, important director animators who became famous thanks to the films Institute, Benjamenta, and the piano tuner of Earthquakes. They are not pianos, but I'm certainly enjoying the privilege of working on these mechanical marvels. The brothers created the animated sequences for Frida and made the music video for Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer. The Quay's dark, moody style is recognizable from the first moments, and Nolan shed some light on the mystery surrounding their art. You can create whole universes with, with puppets and with decors. The director also helped them to restore the film reel from some of their most famous shorts, which were later released in a separate collection. 
However, the 8-minute project did not keep Chris busy for long. As usual, the story of his next projects begins in the past. It's confusing. It was the mid-90s. The young couple was traveling in France and decided to cross the La Manche. The young man obsessively fantasized over a screen adaptation of the events which surrounded that place during the Second World War. Like any beginning director, Chris was planning on turning the world of cinema upside down, which is why he wanted to make a film with no script, where hundreds of actors would be given guidelines, but would be allowed complete freedom of improvisation on stage. Emma then first displayed her producer's grasp of reality and told the young man that the idea would never work. 20 years later, Nolan finally accepted his wife's opinion and wrote the script. It was only 76 pages, the shortest in Christopher's career. Despite the fact that Christopher considered the evacuation of Dunkirk to be the turning point of the war. If this evacuation had not been a success, Great Britain would have been obliged to capitulate and the whole world would have been lost or would have known a different fate. The Germans would undoubtedly have conquered Europe. The US would not have returned to war. It is a true point of rupture in war and in history of the world. Militarily, it is a defeat. On the human plane, it is a colossal victory. Historians, however, did not agree with the director. Great Britain had 3 million soldiers, and only 10% were on the shore of Dunkirk. The fleet controlled the La Manche, and the Nazis had lost many of their boats in Norway. Even if the Germans had captured England, the Queen's army would have regrouped in Canada. Plus, the Reichstag was planning an invasion of the Soviet Union, which basically excludes the possibility of a simultaneous attack on two fronts. Despite their difference of opinion, Nolan executed the evacuation itself in painstaking detail. Still, he decided to base the action on imaginary characters, rather than on the memories of eyewitnesses of the battle. Christopher was so taken with the project that he invited the film crew, set decorators, and film crew who had been with him since the first Batman movie, before it even got the green light from the studio. Nathan Crowley was already in France, and planning the production design while Christopher and Warner Brothers met to sign the contract. The team got permission to film on the very beach where the evacuation took place. The movie is absolutely informed by the real place. More than any picture I can think of. A pier was erected on top of a monument dedicated to the event. The original foundations of the mall were still, were still there, so we built on top of that. I think without those foundations, we don't think we could have done it. The town authorities gave the film crew complete freedom to shoot on their streets, and residents of Dunkirk were extras, helped build the set, and worked as administrators. It took over a year and a half for the set designers to fully immerse themselves in the era. While they were busy, Christopher began auditioning the cast. Having studied the history, he realized that most of the soldiers on the beach had been young recruits. Nolan decided to find young actors without serious experience to reflect the reality on the screen. We really were talking about 17, 18, 19 year old actors and that concept was really energizing. The casting director sent him hundreds of auditions, which is when the director saw his lead, Fionn Whitehead. He has an old-fashioned face. The kind of face that makes you believe he could have been alive in that period. In the same way, he chose Tom Glenn Carney, Jack Loden, Anura Bernard, and Harry Styles. When choosing Harry, the director didn't even suspect that the beginning actor was a world-famous pop star and soloist of One Direction. When they met in person, Harry charmed the director so much that he compared the choice with choosing Heath Ledger to play Joker. The critics, however, were equally skeptical of this choice. Chris didn't stop at young talent. He invited Killian Murphy to his project for the fifth time. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. And he even found a role for Michael Caine, though almost no one noticed it. Michael voiced the officer who gave orders to the British pilots. Stay down at 500 feet to leave fuel for 40 minute fighting time over Dunkirk. I wanted very much to squeeze him in here. It's a bit of a nod to his character in Battle of Britain. And also, it's Michael. He has to be in all of my films, after all. 
Another old friend was not so happy about a reunion. Tom Hardy wasn't excited about the idea of hiding behind a mask yet again, but Chris explicitly wanted him for the role of Farrier. The director believed that Hardy was able to communicate every emotion imaginable using only his eyes, something he had noticed while filming the third Batman movie. I broke you. When Tom heard the reason, he agreed to take the role. The last to be cast were Kenneth Branagh and Mark Rylance. Mark took his preparation very seriously. Every day for a whole month, he would go out to sea on a boat and listen to radio archives of the war. You should be at home! Well, there won't be any home if we allow a slaughter across the channel. At the end of May 2016, Nolan began shooting. The director literally led the team through fire and water. Christopher brought to life risky ideas. The bare minimum of computer graphics, real airplanes and ships, and of course, thousands of extras. But in order to depict such a number of people, the production designers had to get creative. In the wide shots, the actors were surrounded by cardboard silhouettes. It's a great old school effect. Chris had kind of said a few times, let's do it like they would have done it before the technology existed. As for the events in the water, the actors were carried by the same 20 ships, which evacuated the British soldiers in the 40s. Hoyt Van Hoytema didn't fail to amaze this time either. He walked the length of Dunkirk Beach with a 60-pound camera on his shoulder. I really wanted to make that camera work as any other camera you would use. Filming the air battles was a separate challenge altogether. The team rarely used models and mostly used real airplanes from that time period. It fires, George. Greatest plane ever built. Three Spitfires costing $6 million apiece were provided by American billionaire Dan Friedkin. His collection is second only to one person in the world the Queen of England. Dan himself flew the plane in the landing sequence, and since the tide was coming in, they only had 45 minutes to shoot the scene. Friedkin's Spitfire was the first plane to land on Dunkirk Beach since the times depicted in the movie. No one was planning on using that scene for the finale, but when he rewatched the material, noticed the mute scene in the train. It brings you back to this personal moment. He's trying to process the words he's just read from this very eloquent politician and trying to reconcile that with his experience. Hopefully the audience is trying to do the same thing through his eyes. They finished filming in the beginning of September, and the movie went to editing. Lee Smith was given 50 hours of material, from which he made 16 versions of the film. Christopher's main goal was to reflect the difference in time between land, water, and sky. Events are shown simultaneously in the movie, though they occur at different speeds. Hans Zimmer's soundtrack added to the suspense. Nolan gave the composer a recording of a wristwatch ticking and suggested that he make it the central piece of the musical composition. Zimmer heeded the request, and the sound can be heard throughout the whole film, stopping only when the main characters leave the shore of Dunkirk. Dunkirk premiered on the 13th of July, 2017. Veterans who saw the film said that the film accurately represented their memory of the events. Their only remark was regarding the loudness of the explosions, which they said were much quieter on the beach. Over the next three months, the film received rave reviews, made half a billion dollars at the box office, and received eight Academy Award nominations. 
Lee Smith won an Oscar for Best Film Editing. Dunkirk, Lee Smith. And the film won two more Oscars in sound editing and sound mixing. Unfortunately, luck favored neither Hans Zimmer nor Nathan Crowley and Hoyt Van Hoytema lost to Roger Deakins. Christopher was nominated for the first time as a director, but was beaten by Guillermo del Toro, whose Shape of Water also won Best Picture, leaving Dunkirk in the dust. We shall never surrender. Three years later, Christopher's 11th feature film will be released in the autumn of 2020. All I have for you is a word. Tenet. Tenet is an epic undertaking in the director's career, with a budget of over $200 million. And the participation of Hoyt Van Hoytema promises a visual feast. The story tells of a secret agent who tries to prevent the Third World War with the help of time travel. Time travel. No. Inversion. The film was shot all over the world from Mumbai to Tallinn, where they even shut down a main highway for a whole month. The main roles are played by John David Washington, Robert Pattinson, and Elizabeth Debicki. Also, in the ensemble are Kenneth Branagh, and of course, Michael Caine. Unfortunately, not all of Christopher's friends could join the project. Hans Zimmer was unavailable. He was writing the soundtrack for Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Instead, the composer invited his old friend, Ludwig Göransson, to replace him. Ludwig rose to fame when he received an Oscar in 2018 for his work on Black Panther. Lee Smith, who had worked with Nolan on every film from the first Batman, also couldn't participate because of work on the war drama, 1917. So, Jennifer Lame, whose recent hits included Hereditary, and Marriage Story took on the role of film editor. Hollywood entrusts Tenet with the mission to resurrect the movie industry, since after six months of quarantine, Nolan's film will be the first major production in theaters all over the world. A fitting mission for the person who has devoted his life to the art of making the impossible a reality.